Again, I'm Jason Riley of the Manhattan Institute, and uh, our next discussion is, is titled uh, Discrimination and Disparities. Uh, another book title from uh, Thomas Sowell from a few years ago. Is policing a bigger problem than crime? Um, and along with the last panel, education, um, uh, I, I think that, um, uh, that the discussion around crime in this country is, is, is criminal. Um, <laughs> frankly, um, you know, as I watched those George Floyd protests play out a few years ago, it, it was otherworldly to me. Um, I, I think, like a lot of people in this room, um, uh, I've lived in, in low-income uh, black neighborhoods, gone to school in those neighborhoods, worked in those neighborhoods, and I don't ever recall a time when the people living there thought the police were a bigger problem than the criminals. And that was the narrative constantly pushed. Um, it sort of reached its apex under, after the Floyd uh, murder in Minneapolis, but it didn't start there. And, and that has been the direction of this discussion in recent years, and I find it uh, otherworldly um, that uh, we, we've reached a point where uh, law enforcement is being blamed, scapegoated, for social inequality in America. If only these, those police would leave black people alone, everything would be fine. That seems to be, I mean, that's a slight caricature, but it's largely the direction of the conversations I hear. Uh, so we wanted to assemble a panel to discuss, to discuss, to help me understand what is going on here. And um, I will give, for the sake of time, some brief introductions of, of my panelists. Uh, if you want longer, longer versions, they should be in the, in the package you have. But beginning my far left is uh, uh, Ralph Mangwell, uh, also a senior fellow at the uh, Manhattan Institute. Um, Roland Fryer is a professor of economics at Harvard. And um, Janice Rogers Brown, uh, who in a more just world would be on the Supreme Court um, <laughs> right now. <laughs> but that is, uh, that, that's another panel discussion. Um, served uh, as a judge on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. So we have a very distinguished uh, panel here. And I wanted to start uh, with you, Judge, judge Brown, um, uh, on sort of a 30,000 foot question. Critics of our criminal justice system point to the racial disparities in arrests and incarceration and conclude that the system is inherently racist. Um, how do you respond to that charge? Is there evidence that blacks are treated differently for the same offenses? And if racism isn't driving these imbalances in the system, what is? Well, I think um, with uh, homage to uh, Tom Sowell, um, he talked about uh, the problem with disparities uh, equaling discrimination. Um, and he starts that, he has a book by that name, and he starts the section on uh, uh, criminal justice with the um, uh, quote from Mark Twain that there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> and, uh, and so his point is that you can have uh, a number which seems to be factual, which is in fact accurate, but which is misleading if you don't know the premise that is being used in order to develop that information. So for instance, most of what we see that says, uh, you know, there's a big problem with the criminal justice system with uh, arrest and sentencing and conviction um, is based on um, looking at these numbers and then looking at the proportion of black people in the general population, which of course is not uh, the relevant criteria. Um, when, when you don't do that, when you look at the, um, the rate of violent crime, and the proportion of black people who are involved, uh, then those differences tend to disappear. Now, I'm not, uh, I don't do empirical work, and uh, I'm not somebody who figures out statistics, but, and I think our other panelists will talk about that, but it's very clear 
um, that we're not seeing a true picture because people tend to focus on um, what gives them um, a number that looks like the most outrageous number that you could come up with. And there has to be a reason for doing that. Um, there has to be some payoff. Um, uh, Jason, in his book about Tom Sowell, uh, Tom Sowell says, if you want to help people, you tell them the truth. Um, and so I think the reverse is also true. If you want to manipulate people, uh, you give them propaganda, right? Um, you distort the information in such a way as to have them have an emotional reaction to it instead of being able um, to think about it logically. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Fryer, uh, a, a few years ago, you, you dropped a, the equivalent of a nuclear bomb into this conversation with a, a study <laughs> that, that you published and got widespread attention. Um, it was a study about uh, policing and, and race. And I wonder if you could uh, talk about your findings. Uh, you know, what, what did the data show and, and what did it not show? Sure. And before I start, I just want to say that I, I thought this was going to be the easiest paper I'd ever written in my entire career. I just, I was so biased against the police myself, frankly. So I, I thought, this is clear. I'm going to get some data. I'm going to show the police are discriminating. And this is a way to, to protest because being outside actually protesting, I don't, you know, I don't like the sun. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so what we did is we collected millions and millions of data points um, across the country. And the, the paper has there's kind of three basic points. Number one, we wanted to try to understand whether or not there were racial differences on lower level uses of force. Routine stops where people might be thrown up against a car or the weapon pulled on them, et cetera. And, and it, that's hard to find data on that because in a routine arrest, putting handcuffs on someone or kind of putting them up against a car, well, that's, that's, that's what you do, that, that's business. That's, they don't even collect data on that. And so it's really difficult to find um, as millions of data points on police stops where uh, it was just policing, just uh, you know, kind of civilian contact type things. So we did that and what we found was that there are large racial differences in lower level uses of force. Putting hands on people, throwing them up against a car, et cetera. And probably the most disturbing fact is that um, even when the police themselves say the suspect was fully compliant, the racial difference in uh, the likelihood of having force on, used on you, the person wasn't arrested, there was nothing, and the person was fully compliant, according to the police, is still 25%. Okay. And so we found very large racial differences in police, and this paper's been attacked a lot. I, I think it's withstood a lot of these attacks, but the, one of the things that People say it was, oh, Roland's so dumb. He's using data on the police. You can't trust that, right? OK, I'm not quite as dumb as I look. Um, uh, if you have data from the police that show bias, right, then that's kind of a lower bound of the true bias. Duh. Right? Are we allowed to say duh anymore? I'm bringing it back. <laughs> duh. OK. So there are large racial differences in lower level uses of force, OK? Then what we did was we collected data on 18 cities on actual shootings. So our first data set came from right here in Dallas, Texas. And I'll never forget it because we were foraging around trying to find data. It's very, it turns out if you just call a police department and say, could you give me all your data on police shootings? <laughs> you know, it you know, doesn't turn out well. So, so <laughs> we, we did all this and we got 300 shootings from here in Dallas. And I'll never forget, I sat down at my, my coffee table, put my, my two daughters to sleep got a strong cup of coffee, and, and I thought, I can't believe police shoot people the way they do. And I read these 300 narratives, they're 50 pages a piece. We had 300 of them. And so what we found, though, when we did all those cities, and, and in Houston, we had the, the best data uh, of all of our data sets, um, and because we not only had all of the shootings that had happened in Houston for 15 years, we had a, a randomly pulled by us set of interactions with police where force would have been justified but wasn't used, okay? Sorry to be a data nerd, but you need the zeros here. Or as uh, Derek Neal, my friend from University of Chicago, told me when I was writing the paper, we need the risk sets. You need to understand what could have happened, okay? And Houston afforded that on two dimensions. Number one, I know I'm going too long, but no, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, Houston afforded that in two dimensions. One, zero, one, we could tell whether or not we thought the, the, the force could have been used but wasn't, 
Okay? And second, uh, in Houston, on the strong hip, they carry a, a Glock 9. On the weak hip, they carry a taser, so we could look at gun versus taser. In any, I'll cut to the chase. In any way we cut the data, there were no racial differences in shootings. Okay? And it was like people lost their minds, right? I mean, the attacks were so funny. I mean, not, not all of them. Some were like, whoa. But, but some of them were so funny, like, oh my God, he's using regressions, right? I was like, I thought that's what we did. I mean, I didn't know that's what we did before. Um, and, or, but the real, one of the real critiques was, um, uh, you know, if you look at the videos um, that, were, that were all shown, it is, to oversimplify, traffic stops gone amok, okay? And so um, the question then becomes, hey, Roland, if you are starting with a set of traffic stops, isn't that a biased set because, you know, that in itself could be biased, okay? Absolutely fair. The issue is you have to actually really look at the data. You gotta go beyond that because more than 80% of shootings happen uh, with 911 calls for service. So that if you actually sit and look at the narratives, what you'll see is the vast majority of police shootings are there is a robbery in progress, three people call the police, they can see a gun, the police come down and they shoot the suspect. Okay? It is these 12 videos or so, or 15 that we've seen that are horrific, don't get me wrong, uh, are just not what the data tell you. Okay? Um, now, could you convince me that in the distribution of egregiousness of police shootings, that if you went at the 98th percentile, that there's a racial difference in the 98th percentile? Maybe, but you can't estimate that with 15 data points, okay? What I'm saying is that the mean of that distribution is zero, okay? So big racial differences in lower level uses of force, none when it comes to shootings, and uh, the, uh, the last piece is, and I promise I'm, I'm looking 30 seconds, is that um, what we did was say, okay, well, let's look at the way federal, the federal government investigates police departments. Uh, and the issue that happens is that what we found in the data is that when an investigation is announced um, in the more recent kind of history that we live in, so there's virality of the video, and then you go and thump your chest and announce an investigation of the Chicago Police Department for something like Laquan McDonald, what happens is the police pull back, okay? It, the month, if you look at the police-civilian interactions in Chicago, the month before uh, the investigation and the month after, the amount of regular old contact between civilians and the police went down 89%. It's the most beautiful graph, disturbing, but beautiful graph I've ever <laughs> produced in my career. I mean, it's just phenomenal, okay? And then crime goes up. So what we, we estimate is that for the, the three awful shootings and lives that we lost, uh, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, and Laquan McDonald, where there were investigations, those investigations caused 1,000 additional lives lost. One quick follow-up. Even though you found uh, racial disparities and non-lethal use of force. To Judge Brown's point, can we assume from that that racial bias is the reason? Well, there's a series of statistical tests that, that we put the data through. And um, for example, Gary Becker outlined this thing, he called it outcomes test in his Nobel uh, 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 speech in 1993. Uh, and we put the data through that test. And so yes, we actually do believe on the lower level uh, uses of force, there is bias there. It's not just a disparity. Um, the issue, Jason, is I I've talked to hundreds of cops trying to understand this research. It's like a mantra when you ask them about shootings. They'll say things like, discharging your weapon is a life-changing event. I have never heard anyone say, roughing up a black teenager is a life-changing event. Yeah. Okay, and so maybe there are some incentives, et cetera, that we can put. I think there are solutions to that, which I hope we get to solutions. But yes, we do. I, I think that the lower level uses of force are biased, um, but we don't find the, the differences in shootings. And I, I ask you that because I think while there are some on the left who have misread your data, some on the right have read too much into it. Yeah. And, and I wanted to give you a chance to reply to that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, again, th th something about this paper makes people lose their minds. And, um, 
you know, I had people sending me emails saying, thank you, this shows me why the NFL shouldn't be kneeling. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> right? And so um, I, I think that, yes, it's been misused for, for folks' political agendas. And, and I tried to write an op-ed, I did write an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal trying to be very, very clear about this. Yeah. The thing about the lower level uses of force that are, that are important is they happen thousands of times a day. Yeah. And if we're gonna really do real reform with, with police, not to police, then maybe that's an area to start, okay. right? And so that's why I, I like to emphasize that. Um, uh, Ralph, you've done a lot of reporting on, on crime, interviewed police chiefs, police officers, and so forth. Um, um, how do you respond to the argument that low-income minority neighborhoods are over-policed? Um, and that's why we have these racial disparities in our jails and prisons. The, the police spend all their time in these neighborhoods, so of course they're going to uh, find more criminality in these neighborhoods. Yeah, um, I mean, there are a couple ways to respond to that. I mean, one thing I like to say is that I'm old enough to remember when one of the central critiques about police racism was that they weren't responsive enough mm -hmm. to black crime. There, you know, you can hear it in rap music, these references to how long it takes police to respond to a 911 call in a black neighborhood versus a white neighborhood. We reformed that institution over the course of the 1990s into the early 2000s and made police extremely responsive to crime in the black community, which is disparate. That's just a reality, right? One of the things that gets really left out of the conversation about disparities in criminal justice and policing is that we, we tend to focus on one side of the ledger, right? We look at the costs associated with enforcement. We look at these measures in disparities in arrests and incarcerations and in uses of force. What we never talk about, though, are the outputs of, the, of that system. And that's, it's not, arrest is not the only output. Uh, use of force is not the only output. So are crime reductions. When you talk to police chiefs in any part of the country, the thing that they tell you that they're most proud of are when they presided over a reduction in crime. Now, who benefits from that? Well, that's the other side of the ledger. In the United States, black Americans make up about 13% of the population and in 2020 constituted 53% of homicide victims. In my home city of New York, every single year, a minimum, a minimum of 95% of all shooting victims are either black or Hispanic. Almost all of them are male. So you have to ask yourself, what do you want police to do? Is it right that on the Upper East Side of Manhattan that that precinct should have as many police resources dedicated to it as East Harlem, which has a homicide rate that's three or four X? I, I think that if that were the reality, the critique about racism in police would be real. Um, and thankfully it's not. And so yes, it is true that when you have police officers spending a disproportionate amount of their resources and time in low income minority neighborhoods, you're gonna have a disparity in terms of outcomes in low income minority neighborhoods. But that's where police are needed. And the benefits are disproportionately um, dispersed to those areas. There was a, a study by a, a criminologist named Patrick Sharkey who looked at the homicide decline between 1990 and 2014. That homicide decline was, I mean, it was really one of the biggest achievements in urban American history, if you ask me. I mean, it was, uh, our homicide rate was cut in half as a country. In my home city of New York, we went from 2,262 murders in 1990 to 292 in 2017. I mean, um, well, he looked at the racial um, uh, uh, sort of uh, dispersion of, of the benefits associated with that. It added 0 0.14 years to the life expectancy of white men in this country and 1.0 years to the life expectancy of black men in this country. The public health equivalent of that, as he puts it, would be to eliminate heart disease altogether or obesity altogether. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just profound. Mm -hmm. So no, the answer is that I don't think low-income minority communities are over-policed in light of the disproportionate burden that they bear of the crime. And then, you know, there are other ways to respond. You can look at data, there are studies that look at the benefits of spending additional resources on police, and they consistently find that there's still a large return. So there was one study done by a criminologist named Aaron Chalfin that found that in 2010, every additional dollar on police produced a, a benefit of $1.63, a 63% return. Um, uh, Chalfin and, and Morgan Williams, another uh, criminologist, recently did another paper looking at the addition of police officers, and each additional police officer abates 0.1 homicides. So for every 10 cops, you have one fewer homicides. But the benefits were most pronounced 
in black communities. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you know that's 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 the I think the main response. If you're going to argue that they're over policed, then you have to grapple with the other side of that ledger, and that's the benefits. Um, Judge Brown, I, feel free to respond to to what you've just heard, but I also wanted to ask you about um, these so-called soft on crime policies that seem back in vogue. Um, we have district attorneys in major cities bragging about how few people they are going to prosecute if elected. We have effectively decriminalized shoplifting in cities all over the country. Um, what do you make of these developments? And we're told they're being done in the name of reducing these disparities. Will they? Well, first of all, I um, think this is outrageous. Um, when uh, law enforcement, particularly um, attorneys, district attorneys and uh, city attorneys and people like that are um, basically saying we won't enforce the laws that are on the books. They not only violate their oath, um, I think they undermine, undermine the rule of law. Um, and uh, the people who are harmed by this are the very people who they say they are doing all of this um, to help. Um, there are no no one that I know of in uh, most um, poor neighborhoods who think that um, it's better if um, crimes don't have any penalties, if we create incentives <laughs> for criminality, essentially. Um, and if you look at the places where um, this has been done, California being a prime example, <laughs> um, because, uh, because of three strikes, they. Uh, have tried for years chipping away at that. And what they finally did was to say, well, if you steal under $950, right. uh, it's essentially, not, it, that used to be a felony. Now it's not even a misdemeanor. It's actually an infraction. They give you a ticket if they do anything at all. Um, so most uh, merchants who are dealing with that um, don't even respond. I mean, they don't try to do anything about it. They don't try to find out you know, who did this or call the police. But what happens is you create this incentive, which it's fine. They're saying 950, you can steal that. It's kind of, you get out of jail free card. Uh, but people don't just do it one time. They come back several times a day and fill their shopping carts. Um, and so what, what actually happens is those stores close down. They move away from those neighborhoods. Um, and so uh, once again, the impact is on the poor people ha who have to deal with the results of that. Um, one of the things that you may have seen is that Union Pacific uh, Railroad, which has a, uh, a, a facility in Southern California, uh, the theft from their railroad cars got so bad that they threatened to close that down and not have that facility in, in California because they were losing uh, all of this money. And they said, your leniency is exacerbating the problem. But if you saw the photographs of that, it really looked like something unbelievable. I mean, the tracks were littered for miles with all these boxes where people had broken into rail cars and so forth. So none of that um, is dealing with the perceived problem, if there is one, but um, it is, kind of a, um, you know, we spoke last night about the road to serfdom. You know, this is the, uh, the cliff to chaos. I mean, you just are <laughs> you're just falling into this situation where um, it's an unlivable situation. Um, people in beautiful communities are afraid to go outside. This is not just the poor. This is everybody that's being affected by this. Okay. So I, I think it's, a, it's ridiculous if their justification is that it's about poor folks. Um, you cannot solve the problem of disparity by saying, well, if there's disparity, uh, we just won't enforce any laws, and therefore there won't be a disparity. I mean, that's a ridiculous way to respond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Professor Fryer, uh, you're an economist. Uh, on, on, uh, at, at this conference, uh, most of the panels have an economist uh, participating. That's by design, and one of the reasons is that um, some of us like to deal with people who think empirically, who bring data to a discussion. But what, does, uh, you know, what are the lessons you've learned 
from using the data you've come up with to make your arguments against a, a very emotional narrative they throw back at you. Um, um, data seems to be uh, less important than owning the narrative. And, and you can throw all kinds of numbers at them, whether we're talking about educational achievement, crime, uh, marriage rates, what have you, um, they come back at you with a narrative that seems to be completely divorced from the data and yet carries the day. Yeah, I, I think you, you just said it. I mean, I think that the, what have I learned? I, I've learned that um, a couple things. One, I'll start with the positive thing I've learned. I think there's just a hunger for it in the population. So um, my police paper garnered a lot of criticism from a, a lot of places, but it also, I, I received thousands of emails a day for weeks of people just saying, thank you for um, at least giving me some data that, that I can start to understand what's going on in the country. And so I was, I, I, and I responded to every single one of them because I just thought that was a, a real teaching moment. So I think that's really positive. And I think there's, we forget that the 1% uh, that are always in our face about these types of things, there's a silent 99% you know, out there who, who really just want to use data to get better and try to make progress on these issues. I think I've been surprised at, <clears throat> I'm just gonna call it cowardice of some social scientist on this. Um, you know, there's a, another popular paper that shows the same thing that we do uh, on the racial difference in police use of force. And turns out, they show the same thing on the shootings too, but it's in appendix table 74. <laughs> okay, I, and, and it, that is irresponsible, yeah. okay? Um, and, and we never call that, that kind of stuff out. So I think that, that, is, that is an issue. And, and I think the, 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 what's been interesting to me is watching people, and maybe this is just my naivete, Jason, but watching people bend themselves in pretzels not to believe the results. Um, and that, it's been just a really interesting observation to, to watch. Uh, and but but is, the, is the reaction uh, to your work the reason more people <laughs> aren't willing they're burying the data in Appendix 74 because of, of, of what, I mean, is this a problem uh, among academics, this, this intellectual cowardice? Um, well, I think so, yeah. right? Like, I mean, I, I have, uh, there are a lot of students that refuse to work on these issues now, okay. right? There are a lot of students, I remember sitting in my office with, 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 with a student who, um, found something relatively interesting on race and police. He shows it to me and he says, well, can't say that in public. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> what do you mean you can't say it in public? What does that even mean? Right, you're a graduate student. Um, and so I think that, that, I mean, it's not like it's Justice Thomas or the judge here, like I can't, <laughs> can't say that in public. I might move markets, right? Like, like, you're a graduate student. Um, <laughs> okay. But I think that, I, so, I, so I think that's the problem, is that, is that the, if the smartest minds aren't willing to work on these issues because they're scared, then again, every time we take these, these, these types of risk, et cetera, it is black people who suffer. Okay, yeah, uh, and to, just to follow up on that, Ralph, um, Professor Fryer said earlier, uh, one, of the, one of his findings was that uh, when we start scapegoating police for this, when these um, um, high profile shootings result in these investigations, not just of the individuals involved, but the entire police department uh, in, a, in a city, police, police pull back, they're less proactive. Um, um, one of the, the tactics that police have used over the years, uh, some argue effectively, is stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. uh, then it fell out of favor for a while. In some places, um, it's coming back slowly. Uh, why don't you talk about what the criticisms of stop and frisk were? Um, were they valid? Is the practice effective? I mean, what is what has what, what your reporting shown? Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk mostly about New York because I think that was the highest profile kind of example of a, a stop and frisk mm -hmm. policy or program, if you will. And the criticisms were that as the number of stops ramped up, um, you ended up 
placing a, an undue burden on low-income minority communities where, again, police were spending a lot of their time because that's where the crime was. Um, but you had a lot of these instances in which these uh, you know, kids who weren't doing anything at all were kind of mistaken for potential perps, patted down, and that this was you know, an upsetting experience, that this was an embarrassing experience. And, and you know, I, I understand all of those criticisms. And, you know, as for the policy, the argument was that the NYPD kind of created this incentive um, for bad stops, for cops to kind of be overbroad in their application of the policy. And I think there may be something to that, but I think we have to sort of pull back and understand the moment. Right in the mid 1990s, New York was coming off of three years in a row almost of 2,000 murders. Um, I mean, the city was desperate and, and the citizens were adamant that something had to be done. And so it's not crazy to me. Um, that that a, a police executive might think, okay, well, let's let's incentivize the kind of behavior that we think is going to turn up contraband, that we think is going to lead to the discovery of open warrants and you know uh, other op opportunities to make arrests. Um, but I do think that there is a valid criticism that it was overused at one point. Okay. Now, what do we do about that? We can say, okay, well, let's just roll this back and incrementally reform this in a way that we're still retaining its value. And it did have value, right? There were studies, show, uh, there's a great paper by a criminologist named David Weisberg who looked at stop and frisk in New York and found that in crime hotspots, um, stops were actually associated with a, a significant deterrent effect uh, on crime. Now, again, we can argue about whether that, those costs are worth it or worth bearing. Um, and that's a valid uh, uh, debate to have. But the idea was that every time you saw one of these instances in which a stop was reported, um, and that's a really important thing, right? A stop was reported. If police officers have incentives to report stops, they're often going to report stops. That doesn't necessarily mean a, a stop and frisk took place. A stop and frisk is a, it's a legal term of art in, in a lot of ways. It refers to a, a case called Terry versus Ohio. It, it, basically, you have to have reasonable suspicion that criminal activity is afoot. If you have that, then you can detain a person against his or her will. Now, if I'm a cop and I walk up to you know, a, a group of teenagers on a corner, and I say, hey, what are you guys doing here? They start interacting with me. And I say, you got anything on you that you shouldn't have? And they say, no, no, we're, we're all good. And you say, you don't mind if I check, do you? Go ahead. Well, that's a consensual encounter, right? But you have every incentive to report it as a level three stop in New York City um, if, you're gonna, if that's what you get credit for. So I, I think we have to kind of you know, take the data with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, but, but we were told to look at these instances in which a stop was reported and no contraband was found as prima facie evidence of bias on the part of the police officer. Um, and I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong for a lot of reasons because it, it's not, Reasonable suspicion is a relatively low bar, right? It doesn't, you, you don't, it, it just because someone turned out not to be uh, engaged in criminal activity doesn't mean that the reason you were wrong was bias. And I think in a lot of ways, police officers pick up on something that people are putting out there. And there's a really great book that I, I hope uh, a lot of you have read, but if not, you should go read it. It's called Code of the Street by a sociologist named Elijah Anderson. And he embeds himself in North Philadelphia in the 1990s and sort of reports on, just kind of does an anthropological assessment of what's going on and how people carry themselves. And what he finds is that there is this code of the street, as he puts it, where you know, young kids kind of adopt this outward facing posture of aggression uh, that communicates proximity to violence and uh, adjacency to criminality. And in that book, I remember him writing that, you know, while this often functioned as an effective defense mechanism against predators in, in that community, right? If I don't really want to end up scrapping every day, I'm, I'm going to look tough and that's going to protect me. Well, it also, he says, confused shop owners who would end up following kids who probably didn't need to be followed while they were shopping but also police who were picking up on those signals. So we have to ask ourselves, do we want police to ignore those signals in, in their entirety? And we end up with a situation like we had in Chicago with Roland Found, with an 89% decline in reported yeah. stops and a huge spike in crime? Or do we want to train police officers to have better eyes and to inform their deployment strategies with data in a way that allows us to be more precise in how we use aggressive tactics like that? Okay. Um, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Brown, uh, mass incarceration is something I wanted to ask you about. Hotly deba debated topic. Critics say we lock up more people in this country than anywhere else in the developed world. Um, do we lock up too many people? Is that the measure? And um, are drug offenses what's driving these racial dis dis disparities? 
in, in uh, the incarcerated population. And is drug legalization the best way to address that, those racial disparities? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Um, we do lock up a lot of people. I think uh, in the developed world, we probably have more people in prison, but we have a big population. We have a very high rate of violent crime. Um, so I know that uh, mass incarceration is now talked about as the, quote, new Jim Crow. Um, but I think people only say that who don't know anything about Jim Crow. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I actually do, but um, so I, again, when you look at the statistics, there's no indication that there's an anti-black bias in people being locked up. Uh, there's a very high rate of violent crime, uh, as Ralph pointed out, uh, very high rate of homicides, um, and so those are the kinds of crimes for which people go to prison. Now, the drug, um, issue I think is a little bit more uh, complicated perhaps. People may not remember that when the crack penalties were uh, really ramped up, uh, that was because black people in those communities were, were begging mm -hmm. for help. Um, the, the crack uh, epidemic set off a lot of violence in those communities. And so both the communities and uh, the legislators, the congressmen who were um, representing those districts asked for help and they sought um, higher penalties. But um, so there were um, a lot of people locked up for longer periods of time um, for drug use. That was particularly true at the federal level. Um, and I think most people, when they are thinking about this, they're looking at uh, what, what was happening on the federal level. Right. Uh, but you have to understand that the feds have a very small percentage of the prison population. Right. Right. Uh, so if you wipe that completely out, you would not change very much about what um, is, you know, is talked about as mass incarceration. Uh, the best analogy that I can give you for this is that if you think about the federal courts, they're like a little... Uh, nice pleasure yacht. They're floating along with their little, you know, flags flying and everything. And they're cute. and so the state system, you know, the prison system there, it's like a super tanker. If they, you know, if they offloaded that onto the federal system, it would sink it. Right. Yeah. So it is not. Um, if you got rid of that part of the drug. Um, uh, arrests and convictions and imprisonments, you wouldn't move the needle very much. That, you know, that, that's the reality. Well, well the, the, the drug offenses aren't driving the I, incarceration rates. It's I don't think yeah. they are. They, they may be driving it a bit for a time on the federal level. Now you yeah. have the First Step Act, and there's yeah. actually mm -hmm. some shifts in that. They're letting people out o earlier and everything. There are a lot of um, <sighs> initiatives um, to try to get people out of prison earlier. There are a lot of lawsuits which are, um, you know, focused on de-incarceration and all that sort of thing where they're trying to say, um, you know, let's not keep people, uh, you know, in prison for such lengthy times. Um, things like three strikes where they had very high penalties for continued uh, criminal activity. Um, a lot of those are going away. So that may change the number somewhat but I don't think it's gonna make um, a huge difference because you know, if you have a high level of violent crime, you have to deal with that. Right. Uh, you know, what government's foremost obligation is to protect people and, and property. People have a right to feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think that just uh, letting people out of prison um, is, again, it's, it's not an answer. It, it, to hold people accountable for um, antisocial, destructive, and lethal conduct, um, that's not something that we should find objectionable. Okay. Um, Professor Fryer, I'll, I'll give you the last word before we uh, turn things over to Q&A uh, uh, with the audience. Um, what, what types of solutions, reforms, would you like to see um, you know, what are we trying now? What's wrong with that? And what would you like to see instead? Yeah, I feel like um, police use of force is 
where education reform was two decades ago. Um, I'd love to see um, police funding tied to collecting data so that we'd actually understand some of where these issues are. I think we need to take a real look at um, the incentives that I described earlier about the lower level uses of force. Okay. Um, someone sent me a note and said, oh, this, you know, lower level uses of force don't matter because, um, you know, I thought it was about black lives. This is, you know, who cares if they get pushed up against a car? And I wrote back, could you give me your address? I'll come push you up against the car. <laughs> <laughs> See how you feel about it. And I, I just think it's a really important, um, I think it's really important because um, <laughs> dignity matters too. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the most important thing for any solution is to do it with the police, okay. not to the police, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, sure, yes. So, I've spent uh, working on a committee with some other, with another economist. I spent months uh, with other data sets investigating whether Roland got it right. And Roland knows that if he got it wrong, I'd tell him. Uh, but every data set we looked at kept getting the same answer that there's a big problem with uh, dignity and these low-level interactions, and you can't find any evidence of racial bias in shooting. And there's actually more variation geographically than there is racially. You're more likely, to, or equally likely to be shot as a white citizen in the West as you are as a black citizen in the Northeast. And I would like on that uh, score to ask the following question. I'm concerned about the move towards stopping cars and searching for weapons. And this especially comes up in Chicago as kind of the new stop and frisk, because there's a law in the books in Illinois, if somebody's in their 30s, they've been working a job, they haven't done anything wrong in 15 years, but they did something stupid when they were 18 and have a felony, and they have a gun under their seat because they live in a bad neighborhood, and they are pulled over, and the gun is discovered, they go straight to a state prison, no questions asked, and there's no, it's mandatory. And there has been this dance between uh, the mayor of Chicago and whoever the governor was for years in that... Uh, Mayors often want to use mandatory sentences for weapons as a way to just go through dangerous neighborhoods and send people straight to prison through these types of search and seizure operations. And if we believe, Roland, and I do, that the slogan should be Black Dignity Matters, um, I want to get Roland and anyone else's response to whether or not the war on weapons can replace the war on drugs in a way that builds resentment and makes police reform harder because people know that they've got a relative sitting in state prison that didn't do anything other than try to have some protection in a neighborhood where the police weren't providing enough protection. Okay. All right. Does anyone want to take that on? Well, I'm not qualified, but I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the, I, I don't know Derek, and, and I, don't, I really don't have the data, but I would say that I, I guess I would worry if folks are carrying, you give a, an interesting example of someone carrying a weapon. My grandmother used to carry a 357. I get it. <laughs> but, but, but there's also a bunch of punks that are 14, right? And, and when I did look at some data, a lot of the shootings that are happening in places like Chicago are like, getting dissed on social media and then you have a gun. And so I think part of the thing that we see in our data, Derek, is that there's even like stuff on the YouTube, you can see gangs are sending out kids with guns on them, yeah. past police. Yeah. And when the police don't 
do anything because they're they're like, look, I'm part of the 11 percent who's not stopping people, right? Or 89 percent who's not stopping people. <laughs> then you just have <laughs> guns around, and then silliness happens and shootings happen. So I think there's an other side of it, and I don't know the net effect. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. I mean, in the city of Chicago, uh, the Chicago Crime Lab did a study of shootings in 2015 and 2016. What they found was the average shooting or homicide suspect had a median um, a mean of 12 prior arrests. 20% of them had more than 20 prior arrests. Um, there is an incongruity with the framing about the need for reform in cities like Chicago and the reality, which I think pushes back on the idea that we are systematically sending people uh, to prison for uh, mere possession offenses, uh, whether they're for weapons or anything else. I mean, if you look at uh, the prison population in the United States, at least the state prison population, which accounts for about 89% of all prisoners, um, the average state prisoner has 11 prior arrests and five prior convictions. The idea that we're systematically denying people second chances is false. It is false. And there's a real cost associated with a broad, overbroad, in my opinion, effort to minimize the kind of outcomes like the one that you described. Am I all for identifying who those people are and diverting them away um, from incarceration? Absolutely. Um, and I think the system probably does a decent job of that. The problem is, is that they're also diverting the 16-year-old gangbanger. I mean, I, I'm just so sick and tired, I almost moved to tears because, I mean, some of these kids are living in these communities where the system refuses refuses to hold these guys accountable, and you end up with a video like the, that I saw on Twitter yesterday of, of a kid running down a street in broad daylight in Chicago dodging bullets yes. Yes. with his backpack. And this kid's got to go to school tomorrow and take a test. I mean, yeah. how do you come back from that? And so I think we have to be really, really careful about letting the marginal case become the mean in our minds as a society, because that pushes us down a road to reform that is absolutely disastrous for these communities. Did you want to add? Did you want to add? Mm. Uh, said it. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> yes, go. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for this incredible panel. Um, you talked about this low level, if some would extend it to harassment. And the data is pointing to the disparities. And so I appreciate that you pointed that out, because now there's this distrust and nervousness in many of these broken zip codes. So we also heard a lot of discussion after George Floyd about the unionized police officers and how they're protected under these unions. And then the discussion moved to community policing. So I'm wondering if you can speak into that for a moment, just so that we can begin to really heal what's broken down. Because as the gentleman on the, my right just pointed out, I don't know your name yet by heart, um, this is real fear for these young kids. This is, this is just not an environment that's acceptable in 8,700 zip codes across our country. So if you can speak Ralph, into how do, wanna, do we... Do you want to take this one? Sure. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think it is really important to figure out ways to bridge the gap that exists in certain communities between the citizenry and the police. And healing that relationship to the extent that it's broken is an important mission. And I think it also serves public safety. Um, I think we also have to understand that part of the distrust is a result of the system failing to do its job. One of the reasons I think, I suspect, um, that you see violence sort of, uh, uh, people take violence into their own hands as a way of, of, of sort of exacting revenge in a lot of high crime communities, I think one of the reasons for that is that they don't really trust the system to step in and do its job. And so they handle things on their own, and that's destructive. Um, you know, I, I think there are certain reform levers that we can look at pulling. Uh, increasing the education level of police is one of them. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of literature showing that college-educated police officers use force less often, even in the same situations that non-college-educated officers um, are in, even when you control for the type of assignment that they get. Um, that's, that's a really good thing. But we're also living in a time in which we have demonized the entire institution and profession. And so what you end up doing is disincentivizing high quality, highly educated, psychologically stable recruits from even considering <laughs> taking this job. 
My father spent more than 20 years in the NYPD. I took the LSAT and the NYPD exam in the same week when I was a senior in college. And when I told my dad that I was thinking about becoming a copy threat and it never talked to me again. <laughs> This was in 2010. <laughs> he threatened to never talk to me again because he said the community's never going to appreciate what you do, and if you make one mistake, they will plaster you on the front page of a newspaper and throw you out without a pension. And he, he kind of scared me straight, and I chose law school. And, you know, I, I, that's probably the right choice for me, but I think a lot of people are choosing not to go into that profession, and it has a lot to do with how we talk about it. So I do think there's a responsibility on the part of the community to communicate that they're actually open to healing that relationship as well. And, and I think that means we have to take the microphone from our activists and give it to the 81% who told Gallup that they want just as much, if not more, policing in their community. Yeah. Can I do a part two to what he just said? Because then what broke down at the national level when Tim Scott was trying to get these reforms? What would you say in one spot? Uh, it's hard to say. I know the, the qualified immunity issue was a, was a big sticking point um, in terms of that, that legislation. But you also have you know, a, a big cohort in Congress that you know, didn't want to see incremental reform. They wanted to you know, defund police or you know, really put a heavy hand um, uh, of oversight um, from the federal government down on these agencies. And, and as, as Roland's work has shown, that, that, that can be problematic. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, the politics are kind of beyond my area of expertise. That's my best guess about, about why things broke down. But um, you know, again, there is low-income black communities consistently report that they want more policing. Um, we have somehow gotten it into our heads that the activists with megaphones holding protests represent the interests of the black community writ large, and that's just not true. I was curious to know, um, is there any correlation between how long a person stays in prison and the possibilities to reform that person? Um, is there any kind of connection at all? Do sentences, the length of sentences really matter in this regard about reforming a person or rates of recidivism? Well, two things I can say about that. One is that this, um, when, when we were looking at three strikes, uh, which was uh, initially a California initiative, I think some other states have it too, but one of the things that um, we looked at was that there are, even though we're talking about how much crime there is, it's actually a small percentage of people uh, who account for a huge amount of the crime that's going on. So you're, it's probably, to 10%, maybe a little more than that. So if you do incarcerate those people, you at, that at least means they are not committing crimes. Um, so sometimes um, initiatives that look at someone who has a very long record and who is a, basically a career criminal, taking them out of the equation um, tends to help. Um, and as Ralph was saying, uh, people don't, go to prison for the first offense. Um, they have often been given many, many second chances and probation and all kinds of things before uh, they, they get a conviction that takes them to prison. The other thing, and this is, I guess, just biological, um, and I don't know that this has changed, but at least at the time when I was looking at it, um, you have young males have uh, are typically very aggressive in that 18 you know, to 25 year old range. But what we found with recidivism, at least in California prisons, was it's like there's a switch that's thrown 42, you can let them out. It's over. <laughs> the testosterone level drops and they become uh, good citizens, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, um, you mentioned, Judge Brown, that incarcerating 10% of them would change it. But we have some grassroots leaders here, and some lucky ex-gang leader, John Ponder, <laughs> with examples where you take that 10% and convert them from predators to ambassadors of peace. Yes, yes. 
And then as a consequence of that conversion, they use their influence in positive ways so that there have been islands of excellence like this in yeah. my city of Washington, D.C. Right. One of our groups, the Alliance of Concerned Men, that created a peace for 100 days in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods, not a single incidence of violence. But there were no social scientists showing up right. to study <laughs> why and how they did it. Why they did it. Anton Lucky and them went into Madison High School, one of the most dangerous schools, and, and they introduced moral mentors and character coaches from that community who served as antibodies, and that transformed that school to one of the most dangerous to the most peaceful. So my point is there, there are islands of excellence that are created in practice around the country. They're, they're not resourced, nor do we have social scientists left or right of center coming in looking at the resilience and perseverance of people in right. these conditions. The answers are gonna come from within. So but we need to resource them and we need to report on them and not just do failure studies yeah. that we're faced with now. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, we have been talking about uh, you know, crime and policing and uh, imprisonment and, and that's how we have handled the problem. That doesn't mean it's the best way to handle the problem. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, um, the, the only thing that I maybe take issue with is I, I don't know about resourcing because it seems like when the government uh, I don't comes in, government. comes in with money, <laughs> then if that's where the that's where you're getting the resources. Take from. some of the hundred million we spent on political campaign, right? Invested in. I I mean, I'm, you're not going to get a you're not going to get disagreement <laughs> from me on that issue because um, I agree with you. One of the things that we didn't get to talk about is kind of you know what's next and you know what do you see um, as the you know as a different way of approaching this and one of my concerns is that the focus that we have on you know, discrimination, uh, identity politics, and all of this stuff is moving us away from what we need to be thinking about, which is you know, how do people, we're never gonna have a perfect world. We're never gonna get everything right. But you know, I grew up at a time when things were more wrong than they are now. <laughs> but I was never told uh, oh, poor you, you're a victim, and so you're, you, there's no way out for you, just forget about it. Um, I, you know, my grandmother would have, if I came in and said, it's not fair, she would say, yes, what's your point? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, life is not fair, oh. but you're going to have to deal with it. That, you know, that's what, you know, that's how she would have responded. So the focus we have on, uh, it's not fair, somebody needs to fix it, you know, you, uh, you have to wait for this to be uh, put into some kind of condition where it's okay now for you. And we're not focusing on that. Well, Judge Brown, that will have to be the final <laughs> word. We're out of time. Thank you, Professor Fryer. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you all. Um,